So I mentioned to you earlier that the two strategies that I've been focusing on in my work um, in, in, in helping teachers deal with differentiated instruction are the use of open-ended tasks and the use of parallel or choice activities. So let me start with an open-ended task to give you a feel for what it looks like. Um, recall that when I use an open-ended task, I'm thinking, what's the big picture? What's the key idea I'm really interested in? in? What, do I, what am I doing this for mathematically? And then I'm able to, to think of a way to allow students to participate at whatever level they are at in that activity. So here's an example. Instead of saying, hey kids, um, I have three and four and six, so what's three plus four plus six? Instead of saying it that way, or whether it's two digit or one digit or whatever, you can say, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to pick three numbers and that you're going to add them, and I want you to come up with a problem that would lead you to add those numbers and tell me what your answer is. Now notice by saying it and that way, I can children. have kids pick really easy numbers. They could pick one and one and one. They could pick two and two and three. They could pick nice and easy numbers if that's where they're at. Or they could pick a million and two million and three million if that's where they're at. Or they could pick 22 and 34 and 15. But that question allows all of those students to participate. It allows all of them to recognize that you add when you're putting things together because the problems that they're going to create are all going to be about putting things together, but they're going to be able to do it at their own level. What's really great about doing that kind of activity is that when you do it, when the students hear each other's work, the student who picked one and one and one is still hearing the kid who picked 15 and 20 and 35 talk about their problems, so they're really getting what we often call that opportunity to learn, that, that more sophisticated thing, but they're feeling success because they were able to make up a problem that they could handle. So they're successful, but they also have the opportunity to learn this new thing. There are seven lions in the cage, eight lions sleeping, and five lions in the room eating. How many all together? I took the seven and took five and put it into the five and the five turns into a ten so I take the two from the seven and put it into the eight that makes it into a ten. Ten plus ten equals twenty. So I ended up with twenty. So in geometry we could use open tasks certainly as as easily, if not even more easily, than with numbers. So, for example, I might say to kids, I want you to uh, take four squares and make a shape with them, any shape you want. What, after you've made your shape, I want you to describe your shape to me. And once you tell me about your shape, I want you to take that shape and think about what other shapes you can make with that one. And notice that some kids will pick one simple little shape they can make with four squares, whether it's a bigger square or a rectangle. Other kids will make a much more complicated shape, you know, a guy up here and a guy over here and whatever, and they'll describe their shapes. Every child in the class gets an opportunity to describe the shape they chose, not the shape I chose for them, because our usual way is I want you to take these four squares and make a bigger square. So what I'm doing differently this time is I'm not giving you my end point. I'm letting you pick the end point so that you're comfortable describing your shape and then you're comfortable describing how your shape can make other shapes. Now the reason I would give a task like that is that one of the most important ideas in geometry is how combining shapes gives you new shapes or how breaking up shapes gives you other shapes. And all of those answers that those kids might give me bring that out but they bring it out at the level at which the student is ready to work, not at the level that I'm demanding. Now for the parallel tasks, when I mentioned to you before that the way those work is you have two different tasks going on. You might actually say to the children, they can choose which task to work on, or you might suggest to a particular child or group of children to work on one task and another child or group of children to work on another. 
and you set them up so that when it's done there is a conversation you can have with all the children but you set them up thinking these kids can handle this these kids can handle this and i want them all to be successful so for example you'll see that the situation i've set up here is a money situation and we've taken some very common items and given them little prices and what we've said to to one for one of the choices is that you have 50 cents you're going to buy two items from this school store and you want to know how much you would have left after you paid for those items and for the other children you're going to tell them to buy one item with 10 cents so what you can cl clearly see is that both of them are working in the store both of them are buying items when you finish the task and you talk to all the kids you can say to any of them so what did you buy and how much money did you have left and how did you figure it out but one of them is working at numbers they're comfortable with the 10 cents and the one item and other kids are working with numbers they're comfortable with the 50 cents and the two items if you have 10 cents you want to buy one item if you buy a pencil for eight cents you will have two cents left i know that 10 take away eight equals two